Hello, everybody. Um, I think we can wait a minute for people to come in, but in the meanwhile, I do want to say hello. My name is Serena. I am with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, and uh, I'm joined here today with Judy, who is our current volunteer. And we also want to thank, of course, the Bay Area Science Festival moderators and tech support for being here with us. And if you can tell us in the chat, open up that chat window, what's your favorite bird if you have one? Um, we're seeing blue jays or eagles, mockingbirds, parrots, all great choices. So today we're going to be talking about our bird scavenger hunt and hopefully you have seen some of that, our, uh, our page for the bird scavenger hunt and we'll go over that really briefly. But for now, we want to briefly introduce ourselves to you. So we're SFBBO. We are a nonprofit organization based in Milpitas, and our focus is on conserving birds and their habitats through science and outreach. And some of our programs include some of our research, which includes bird banding, which is when we catch birds and we attach a little metal ring to their leg. And that ring has a specific unique number on there. And that helps us keep track of birds that are here. We also monitor snowy plovers, which you can see a baby one on this page. It's super cute. And they're, they're threatened species. We also monitor least terns, which are an endangered species here in California. And so we keep track of their populations and we try to help improve their populations too, since there aren't that many of these birds left. We also monitor water bird colonies. And this involves not just our staff, but also lots of volunteers getting engaged in community science. So what we do is we monitor colonies of birds that breed here every summer. And we've been doing this for nearly 40 years. So all this information helps us understand how birds are doing and also how changes in the environment are affecting them. We also restore habitat. So that means we improve habitat. So our wildlife, especially our birds have places to live. And of course we do education. So events like these, and also we have done a birdie hour speaker series, which is where we invite scientists and birders to talk about their work and their experiences to share with the public. And these are you know, generally free. So we hope you'll check us out. Uh, we are always trying to do more for the community and of course to help our birds. And you might wonder, what, what is it about birds? Why do we care about them? Why do we focus so much on them? Well, birds are really important, not just because they're cool, like all the great birds that you said, but also because they're a really important part of the ecosystem. So the ecosystem is the place that we're at and all the living and non-living things in that area. So it's the plants and the animals and also the air, the water, the soil that they interact with. So birds are an important part of that. And in this little graphic here, you'll see an example where we have a food chain where we start with a plant and you know plants are kind of the base for a lot of different ecosystems and we have things that eat them like insects and then we have birds that you know many of them do eat a lot of insects and that's really important because they do help keep insect populations in check so they're not eating all the plants uh, so that's a really important role that birds play but birds can also be energy sources for other animals like snakes and foxes. These are animals that eat them. So that's another really important role for birds. And here in this example, you can also see that birds can be at the very top of the food chain. So really big birds like eagles, hawks, and falcons, they can be at the top of our food chain. So you can see here that birds play multiple roles in the ecosystem and each link in this food chain and the food web is important for keeping the ecosystem in balance. So they're all important. And because birds are part of the ecosystem, they're indicators of ecosystem health. So that means we can learn a lot about the health of the environment by paying attention to birds. Uh, birds are really easy to see and hear compared to most other animals. So by paying attention to them, we can learn how they're doing and how the environment is doing. 
because just like us, birds need healthy water, healthy air. They need places to uh, have their babies. They need enough food to eat. So when we're seeing an area where there are lots of birds and they're doing well, that could be telling us that the environment is healthy. But if we see a change and suddenly the birds aren't doing as well, that could tell us that maybe there's something wrong in the, the ecosystem. Maybe there's some pollution, for example. So these are all really important reasons why we pay attention to birds and why we focus on them so much. But birds also play lots of other important roles. They can be pollinators. For example, hummingbirds, when they go and drink nectar from a flower, they often get pollen on their beaks and they spread that to other flowers when they drink from the next flower. So that's an important role for them. They help spread flowers, spread, spread plants. And the same goes for seed dispersal. So lots of birds eat seeds and fruits and you know they, well, they poop out those seeds often, right? And those seeds can turn into new plants. So that's a really important role too. And in addition, because birds are everywhere and they have been so important to us, they've become an important part of our culture too. If you think about symbolism, right? If you think about eagles, they are often a symbol for courage and freedom, and they kind of symbolize our country. Um, and in addition, you know, if you think about something like Twitter that is so popular, right? That's inspired by birds too. So it, it, it's ingrained in our culture. And bird songs and bird movements inspire music and dance. People like drawing birds because they can be so beautiful. And so all of these things are really important. Um, there, you'll notice them everywhere. And because of that, birds are also an important part of our economy too, right? So lots of people spend money to, to see birds. They, they buy binoculars, scopes, um, they buy cameras to take pictures of birds. People also spend money to travel to see birds. And so this results in millions of dollars a year, a year typically. And in addition, you know, I mentioned all these roles that birds play in the ecosystem. And so they provide ecosystem services to us and that's really beneficial. So these are all just a few reasons why we care so much about birds and why they're important. And we hope that, you know, with all this information, you'll appreciate birds too. And so that brings us to our scavenger hunt. And, you know, this is, a way for us to encourage you to pay attention to birds and to appreciate the diversity of birds we have here in the Bay Area. So hopefully most of you have seen this, um, th these pages. It's on our Bay Area Science Festival pages as well as our registration page. So you'll see that we're asking you to find these nine species of birds, which are all really common here in the Bay Area, as well as these behaviors because bird behavior can be really interesting to, to observe. So what we want you to do is try to find these birds between today and Sunday and write down the date that you saw the bird. And then you also see that we have a question for each bird or each bird behavior. And even if you don't see the bird during these dates, you can still answer those questions. Um, there are often things that you can just think about and, and answer. And you don't have to use uh, this sheet either. You can uh, download our more printable version, which doesn't have the pictures. That way you don't have to use so much color ink. Or mm -hmm. um, you can also just write them down on a sheet of paper or in a notebook. You can, you know, use your phone. Just type it in there. T type in your observations. And we'll also ask you to sketch a bird you saw. And the reason why we're asking the, that of you is that sketching is a really great way to pay more attention and hone your observation skills. And even if you aren't an artist, that's totally fine. Just you do your best to try to capture the shape of the bird and that's plenty. Um, it, it's an, again, it's a way to really get those observations in there and pay attention. And of course, we have lots of birds here in the Bay Area and we couldn't fit them all here on, on the scavenger hunt. So if you see other birds, you can list them too or describe them if you don't know what it is. Um, we can try to help you figure out what you saw. 
So do we have some questions that we want to start off with? Yeah, it looks like we have a question from Bidon. Uh, I'm sorry if I messed up your name. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, go ahead. So, what is the difference between the Anna's hummingbird and the ruby throated hummingbird? Like, how to identify them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, Anna's hummingbirds are what we have here in the Bay Area. Um, ruby throated hummingbirds don't really occur here, they're more of an eastern species, and those migrate. So, if you check out to this picture down here of the Anna's hummingbird, the males, that red, reddish magenta color kind of is all over their head when it's uh, an adult male, but I believe ruby-throated hummingbirds just have it on their throat, so that's also a good cue. But if you're here in the Bay Area, you're probably just going to see Anna's. You're not going to get the ruby-throated. That would be very rare. I hope that helps. In my bird feeder, it's the Anna's hummingbird, not the ruby-throated one. Yeah, yeah. Hummingbirds love to come to feeders, and we do get lots of Anna's hummingbirds here. Thank you. Uh, do we want to take some other questions first, too, before we move on? So we have a question from Amanda. She's asking, do we have any tips for identifying birds quickly? That's a great question. And we will share some tips too, some resources as well. Um, so we can get to that in just a minute and hopefully we can get into more detail. Yeah, for sure. And Kavi uh, has a question as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, how, okay, well, are hooded orioles like, um, are they common around the Bay Area and like, around Marin County. Ooh. Um, I've always really liked um, hooded orioles. I really like their colors. So. Yeah, they're beautiful birds. And they are fairly common in the Bay Area. Let me, um, I don't know how common they are in specific parts of the Bay Area, but let me see also their, their range. So they're usually here in the summer. So they've probably left the Bay Area right now, they're probably migrating to their wintering grounds. Um, but starting in the spring and summer, those are good times to try to see them. Um, they do come to feeders. And uh, I think some people use like jelly feeders. Sometimes they come to hummingbird feeders even. Um, but yeah, you can see them. But maybe right now, most of them have left. So you might not see them now. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so these are all great questions. Thank you, everybody. Um, so how about we go ahead and launch a poll because I want to see where you're at in terms of whether you go out and try to find birds. So if you can just take a few seconds to go ahead and, and answer this poll that should be showing up on your screen. I would love to see, you know, have you gone out just to try to find birds. And if we have any other questions, I can also help answer those right now. So we'll do another few seconds. It shows me that six of 14 people have voted so far, half of, of our participants. I think Avery might have a question. Avery, do you still have your question? Yeah. So my question was, why are scrub jays called scrub jays? <laughs> That's a great question. That so, is a really good question. Thank you for yeah. asking that. <laughs> so scrub jays look blue, right? So you might wonder why they're not called blue jays. And blue jays are actually different species, but scrub jays are called that because they kind of live in scrubby land. So when you think about scrub land, it's more like bushy, low vegetation often. 
Um, so I think that's how they get their name. There has been actually this year people were seeing if um, people wanted to change the name to drop the scrub part, but I don't think that passed. So it's still called the California Scrub Jay. Um, but yeah, that is a great question. All right, so um, you should be seeing the, sh the poll results. So we do have a lot of people who have gone out to find birds and we have some that have only seen them only go out sometimes and a few who don't really go out just to try to find birds. So we hope that the tips and the resources we provide today will be helpful for that. So thank you everybody for sharing your, your poll or answering the poll. Ah, so I do see the comment from Amanda that scrub jays, that she thought scrub jays had the pointy feathers on top like the mohawk. We'll actually get to that in just a little bit. All right, so, um, but yes, also Kavi, you're right that the blue jays have the mohawk and those are more of an Eastern bird. We don't really have those here. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and share some tips to help you get started on your scavenger hunt. So first, what we want you to do is pay attention to the size and the shape of the birds because that can tell you a lot about what family the birds are in. And that's a good way to start to look at field guides or apps to know where to look. So if you look at these silhouettes here of birds I have, you can kind of start to see that they're all really different in shape and size. Um, so if you look at something like this, it's really small, it has a long pointy bill, well, that's a hummingbird. Um, they're pretty unique in terms of their shape, right? If you look at something like this that has a really long neck, and then if you look at its feet too, you know, it has kind of uh, not too long in terms of the legs, but it's got these kind of big feet too. That's kind of like a, that's a goose, right? A goose or sometimes ducks look like that too, but ducks might be a little bit shorter in the neck. Um, yeah, so they all have different sizes and shapes. Pay attention to the size and shape of the beak too. Something long and kind of thick like this, this is a raven. Um, but you'll see this one has a really tiny pointy bill. And that shape, that's actually kind of a dove shape, so like a pigeon. Whereas something like this has a short, thick bill. And you might think that could be something like a sparrow. So those are some examples. And if you see a bird that you're not familiar with, try to compare it to some birds that you do know. So an example here is the difference between a duck and a goose, right? Compare those to each other. Or if you see a bird that you're not familiar with, how does it compare to the size of a, a duck? Is it a lot smaller? Is it a lot bigger? Those can help you kind of start to understand how different birds look. Another tip is to listen because a lot of times you can only hear birds um, before you see them. So listen because that'll kind of give you an idea of where to look for that bird. A lot of times, you know, people see birds, but, and they, you hear them, but you don't really pay attention to them. So we do want you to pay attention and actually look for them. And as you get more practice with listening to birds, you can actually identify birds just by their sounds. So we'll share some resources to help you start learning to do that too. Now for this scavenger hunt, all you really need are your eyes and your ears. Those, that's the minimum you really need, um, especially your eyes probably. But some helpful tools would be if you have binoculars or a scope that'll help you see the birds a lot more clearly. Um, you'll, it'll you know, give you a really clear big image of the bird. And I'll actually email some resources for how to choose binoculars and how to use them if you've registered with our page so that that way I have your email. Another helpful tool is a camera. So you can use your phone camera even if you uh, can get close enough to a bird or if it's big enough. But you know, a lot of people also get cameras with really long zoom lenses and that's a great way to see birds in good detail. But that's really helpful for, you know, referencing that photo and trying to identify it. You can go back later instead of trying to capture it in the moment. Um, and of course, field guides are helpful too. So a field guide is a book or, or an app that 
shows you what different birds look like. It might point out some different features of birds. So that's also really helpful. So if you catch a glimpse of a bird, you can kind of flip over to what family you think it might be in and scroll through there and try to figure out which bird you saw. So we hope those are helpful if you have them. Um, but if you don't, that's totally okay. You don't need them for the scavenger hunt, but it's something for to, to, to consider in the future. Now some more tips. So somebody mentioned a mohawk here. We'll get to that in just a second. So first is to note the habitat where you saw the bird, because birds like to live in different areas. There are so many different kinds of birds. So an example we have here is that shorebirds are likely near water. Um, other birds like to hang out in the trees and some like to hang out on the ground. So those are all really good clues to start to figure out what bird you're seeing too. And look for color combinations and distinct markings or plumage. So the example here is our Stellar's jay, which does have a mohawk. So this is another type of jay we have here in the Bay Area. And unlike the scrub jay, this one does have the mohawk. And also notice the black head and blue body or pants, if you will. Um, so that's different from what a scrub jay would look like. So look for those two. Some of them are really distinct like this. And some more tips we have for you is that you can bird wherever you are, whenever you can. So you don't necessarily have to be outside all the time. You can just look out your window and oftentimes there are actually birds around. They'll fly by or they'll be perched nearby. If you can, uh, if you have a backyard, you can look there for birds. If you are in a neighborhood where you feel comfortable walking, take a walk in the neighborhood and you're likely to see some birds. You just have to pay attention. Um, but of course, the great places to go are places like parks and, uh, you know, even the beach if you're near one. Hey, Serena, we have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, so Iman asks, can we, you use the camera as binoculars? Actually, call me Eman, please. Eman, e sorry about that. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. Leave it like that. <laughs> yeah, so that's a great question. If you have a, a camera that can zoom, yes, that's a great way to, to think about it as binoculars. Okay, here's the thing. Yeah, because my Note 20 Ultra has a, a 12 megapixel, um, what do you call it, periscope camera where it can go up to 50 times. If you heard oh, that's it. awesome. Yeah, 50. yeah, definitely yeah. use that. Yeah, that'll be great. I even took a picture of the moon with the 50X camera and actually came out great. That's nice. Great. Yeah, that'll be great for birds. Thank you, Iman. And then was there another question? Hey, Don, did you still have your question? What I wanted to say was I have actually went, went bird watching on that trail, which the picture is showing. Oh, that's rad. Nice. That is me. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> Judy. <laughs> Don Edwards. Yes, how do you like it? It was good. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why you see place. a lot of shorebirds. Nice, thank you for sharing. All right, so we'll kind of finish up our last few tips here. So we do want you to be mindful of the environment that you're in too, if you're going out to find birds, because it is the bird's home. So, you know, try not to scare the birds away because that's just not very nice for the birds. And, you know, try not to litter or disturb them too much. So just be respectful of the environment and of the birds. We also want you to be safe. So be sure to, if you're going out, to try to keep a six foot distance from other people who aren't in your household and wear a mask when you can. And depending on the weather, um, be sure to check the weather forecast before you go outside. Have a light sweater if it's gonna be cool, if it's gonna be hot and sunny, maybe bring some sunscreen. 
And we also want to note that right now it's fall migration. So a lot of birds are back here to spend their winter with us. So you might see things like white crown sparrows and golden crown sparrows. So try to look for those. And if you don't know what those look like, don't worry, because we're going to share some resources where you can look up birds. You can also, you know, use the internet too. If you, uh, we're going to mo mostly be sharing apps, but also uh, websites that will be helpful. So try to look for those and write them down if you see them. So um, let me go ahead and share another poll because I want to know what, uh, what, which of these apps that we're about to share with you that you've used before. So you should be seeing that poll now. Go ahead and take a few seconds to check off which ones that you have used before. And while that's happening, I'm going to just quickly look through the chat too, just to see what people are saying. Nice, you've had seagulls and cormorants, awesome. We have egrets, yes, we do have lots of egrets here. We have uh, two species of egrets actually, snowy egrets and great egrets. Those are both common in the Bay Area. Merlin is the best, yes, <laughs> and we will go over that in just a bit. So, so far, I'm seeing that most people haven't used a lot of these apps, but I will share that in just a minute. All right, we'll go ahead and share this. So yeah, it looks like most people aren't familiar with these. So hopefully what we share today will be helpful. And it looks like a good number of people have actually used the Audubon bird guide. So that's great. All right, so we'll start with Merlin since we're, we've been mentioning that now in the chat. So Merlin is an app that you can download on your phone. It's by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is a fantastic resource. And what it does is it's great for helping to identify birds. So you can hit this start bird ID button and it'll ask you some questions about where, or about, about the bird that you saw. So things like the size, color, where you saw it. And then based on your location, it'll give you a list of possibilities based on your answers. Now, if you get a photo of the bird, you can actually upload that to Merlin and it'll try to give you those suggestions too. So that's another great way to use it. And finally, if you look at this explore birds button, it'll show you this nice big list of birds that are in your area at this time. So you can see what birds are likely to be around you. And that's great for trying to narrow down what bird you saw. So here we can see an example where it's showing us uh, just some of the list of birds around here. And you'll see that you can see a picture of the bird. And if you tap on these individual birds, it'll give you more information. And uh, if you look at these bars, this is telling you what time of year that bird is usually around here. And the height of the bars tells you how common it is. So if we look at the California towhee, which is one of the birds on the scavenger hunt, you can see that it's really common year round in San Jose. And if you click on this bird, you can find much more information about it. So focusing here on the tabs, I just wanna quickly point out the sounds because you can actually click that and listen to what the bird sounds like. And this up here is called a spectrogram and that visualizes what the sound looks like so that is a really great way to start to learn what birds sound like. But I do want to note that you don't really want to play these outside super loud where you might disturb some birds because sometimes playing their calls and songs makes them stressed out and we don't really want to do that. So this is great for learning at home or playing really quietly if you want to figure out if what you're hearing is the same bird. That is a great resource. Now another bird ID app 
is Audubon. So they do have an app that you can also download and it does some similar things where you can hit the identify a bird button and then you can answer these questions and it'll give you a list of the possible birds based on your location and the time of year. And then if you hit search the guide, that kind of gives you more information about individual birds. Um, you can also hit the explore button to see where there are hot spots of birds around you. So that's pretty cool. And they have a great website too, where if you're interested in learning more about a certain type of bird, you can look it up on the Audubon website or in the guide here and it'll give you lots of really great information. And All About Birds is another website that is really great for that purpose too, for finding out information about specific birds. Often if you Google a, a bird species, All About Birds is going to be one of the first websites that comes up. And you can find so much information. They give you information to ID the bird along with photos and sounds and sometimes videos. And you can even see the maps where they occur too. So lots of great information there. Now here's one called BirdNet that I think fewer people are familiar with. And this is just on Android right now, but it's a great app for trying to figure out what bird you're hearing. So what it does is you open it up and then it'll start recording the sounds. And so you can kind of highlight the snippets where you're hearing the bird sound and it'll analyze that part of it and give you suggestions for what bird it is. And that's uh, also, I think, based on your location too. So it's pretty cool. I think it's still a work in progress, but if you have an Android, uh, that's a cool app to play around with. Now, uh, another great app is iNaturalist, and this is really great if you take photos. So what it does, it's a website and an app, and uh, you can upload the photo to iNaturalist. And here you have a button that says, what did you see? View suggestions. And using artificial intelligence and, and other information that you provide, it'll give you a list of what it is, of what, of what it could be. And it's usually pretty good, especially for things like birds. It does work for any living thing though. So if you see a plant that you're not familiar with, you can try to upload it there too, or an insect or anything else. So it's pretty cool. Um, so in this case, it's telling us that they're pretty sure it's this type of sparrow. And actually this first, uh, first result, this first suggestion is what this bird is, a white crowned sparrow. So it is pretty neat. And the other cool thing about it is it's very much a community-based app. So you do community science by uploading your observations to iNaturalist and other people will try to verify what you saw or provide suggestions for what you saw. So that's pretty cool. Um, and another great uh, community science type of app too is eBird. And this is particularly good if you are already pretty familiar with birds. The way it works is when you go out to bird somewhere, you start a checklist on eBird. So what you wanna do is record all the species that you see that you can identify and count how many of each of those birds you saw. And then when you're done birding, you stop your checklist and you upload it to eBird. And, uh, and so that's really great because it keeps track of all the birds you've seen that you've uploaded to eBird. So you know what you've seen and what you haven't. And you're also contributing to science. A lot of scientists use the data from eBird to understand birds better. Um, another cool thing about eBird is that it provides this hotspot map. So these hotspots are where a lot of people go to see birds. And, um, and so that's a great way to figure out what are some good places around me that I can go to to go find birds. And you'd be able to see what birds are seen in that area and uh, how recently they've been seen and that kind of thing. So it is very powerful and you can go to their website and explore those hotspots, um, even if you don't have the app or an account. So do we have questions about those apps first? Let's see. 
be. Okay, it looks like we are okay for now. Um, so I also want to share with you that since we ask for you to sketch a bird, here is a really great resource for learning to draw birds. John Muir Laws is somebody who does a lot of work with nature journals, and he has a website that, uh, where he posts lots of blog posts and video tutorials about how to draw birds, as well as other living things. So remember, even if you're not an artist, you can still sketch. And, uh, but this is a great way to kind of refine those skills. So definitely check out his website if you can, because uh, there are just so many great resources um, and ways to observe birds that he mentions on there. Um, let's see. And then lastly, I want to share that um, we do have lots of birding organizations here in the Bay Area. And so if you are interested in learning more about them, and especially about the birds around you, we really recommend checking out your local Audubon chapter. There are eight of them all around the Bay Area, so you can find the one that's near you. And they often do things like bird field trips when, you know, when times are more normal. Um, but they also do lots of other types of events and they provide resources for where to find birds, what kind of birds are here. They'll provide some cool fa bird facts and things like that. So we highly recommend checking that out if you can, if you're interested in continuing to, to learn about birds. And so with that, I do want to remind you that, you know, you can join us for a closing event on Sunday, October 25th at 12 p.m. That's when we will share our observations and we'll go over those answers on the scavenger hunt. And if you can't join us, we still want to see what you're observing. So you can go ahead and email me your observations. That could be, you know, whether it's pictures or if you're writing down what you're seeing or, um, or you can take a picture of your scavenger hunt pages. You can also share those with us on our Facebook events. We have one just for the, uh, the, the bird scavenger hunt, so you can post on there. Or you can also tag us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is SFBBO. Um, we do also, just so you know, have a hashtag called birding with SFBBO, where you can see uh, pictures that people are sharing with us. So um, those are really fun to see too. So with that, I think I would be happy to take any questions that you have about the scavenger hunt or just about birds in general. Excuse me. Um, do you like quick? Do you, like do you know what I've I've basically been searching like most of the time I've only been searching like owls, but yeah. Um, I've been trying to search them in like. Do you know where is Lodi? Lodi? You know where? What's Lodi? Right. Um, um, I you know there's there's a lake you know, and, and I've been trying to find uh, an owl owls there, but I I actually had hadn't had that much luck. Do you know, like, do you know, like, in the barriers, there are, like, owls that can actually find wild ones, not from, like, the zoos? Yeah, that's a great question. Owls can be tricky to find, of course. Um, oftentimes, they're mostly active and at night. I also don't want to get, I don't want to get those accents either where, where they just <laughs> try to attack us for, for literally no reason. I, I've seen those. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. Uh, you'd be pretty um, unlucky for that to happen. But, uh, yeah, so... I know that, let me think about places to see owls in the Bay Area, because oftentimes, you know, they're pretty hard to find because during the day they kind of sit still in trees and you have to really be lucky to spot one. Um, I know that, um, let's see. So I'm wondering, like, uh-huh. Sorry, sorry. Um, if you go back um, to the Autobahn slide where Roberto's picture is. Yeah. So, that owl is found in East San Jose. Oh, what happened to this? Yeah, let me, uh, let me. So most owls are found in East San Jose? 
No, you can find them all over the Bay Area, um, but they are kind of tricky to to look for because they are nocturnal yeah. and they're pretty quiet um, unless they're calling to each other. Is this like everything and then you're just gonna answer questions, right? So I can leave to go to see the, uh, it's because like I've, I'm just here because I heard about it by school, by my teacher. So I'm just here yeah. to see like um, the aliens and all that too. Yeah. Cause basically here's the thing. Aliens, aliens, aliens. I do not believe in aliens, but I really do just want to see what, what, what they're just going to say. Okay? So, adios. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was, yeah. I would also I just mention, oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, then we can go on to the next question, then. I believe there's a question from Rose. Do we have any field trips for kids? So normally we would have field trips throughout the year that are family friendly. Right now we're not really doing field trips, of course, because of the pandemic, but I do recommend uh, checking out your local Audubon chapter to see if they're doing anything. Um, I, I think there are some organizations that are st still doing like really small bird walks, um, but uh, some of these are also, some of these organizations, these Audubon chapters, are also doing some alternatives to that where either they're doing like virtual versions or um, I know that Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society is doing self-guided field trips. So they kind of have um, typed up these guides that you can look up on their website and that provides really great tips for where to park, what birds you're going to see, where to go. So I do recommend checking that out if you can. We're getting a lot of good feedback on your presentation. Thank you, Serena. Thank you. And I will, um, if you've registered with us on our page, I do have your email. So I will be sending out a lot of these resources as well as some other ones again about binoculars and things like that. Yes, and um, since we're talking about owls in the chat, um, SFBBO does a lot of habitat restoration for burrowing owls. So if you wanna check that out and uh, look it up on the website and see what we do. They're really funny. <laughs> yeah, they're burrowing owls, yeah, they are the exception to the nocturnal rule. So they are our diurnal uh, raptors, our diurnal owls. So they're actually active during the day rather than at night. They are threatened, so they are kind of hard to find because they're suffering from habitat loss. So, you know, a lot of people, including us, as well as some of the, the other Audubon chapters and other organizations are really working hard to, to try to help them recover. Serena should be sending um, resource links, look, links to binocular resources. Um, so keep an eye out for that, <laughs> pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and again, if you haven't already, um, so that we know how to contact you, you can uh, register on our page and you can find the link to do that from the Bay Area Science Festival website or on our website. Do we have any other questions? Any comments for either one of us? <laughs> I think that's it. Oh, how did you get into birds, Serena? Would you like to start? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I've always loved animals in general. And I would say that I first got into birds when my, well, I don't know, there are a few different times. So I used to watch a lot of TV shows and read a lot of books all about animals. So 
I remember doing a report and choosing to do one on the elf owl for some reason. It's just this really cute, tiny, tiny, tiny owl. Um, so I did a report on that. So I guess that was my first recollection of being really interested in birds. But after that, my mom surprised me with a couple of budrigar, like the little parakeets. And she was very anti-pet, so it was a huge surprise. And so from that point, I got super into parrots. And that's actually how I got my first like bird book, was Birds of the World. And I was just always focused on that parrot page. But of course, there are tons of other birds too. I would say that I mostly got into birds specifically in college, probably, when um, you know, I was studying environmental science, I was taking lots of these courses, and I took ornithology, which is the study of birds. So that kind of got me more into them. Um, and from then on, uh, you know, pretty much all of my work has been with birds. Judy, do you want to share? Yeah, uh, like you, I have always loved animals. Um, I have a dog. I initially went to school to um, do biology, but it wasn't until I took ornithology that um, it gave me a deeper appreciation for birds because it allowed me to look at the world differently. Like we always see birds, but we never focus on them. So it was really rad to see so many different kinds of birds. Um, my first interaction with a burrowing owl was about 10, over 10 years ago. Um, and I was like, whoa, there's an owl in the ground. That is so weird, but that is really cool. And after that, it was just, you know, making sure that what can, what can I do to learn more? And uh, now I volunteer at the Wildlife Center of Silicon Valley and I help rehabilitate um, wildlife and I uh, volunteer with SFDBO and, you know, just putting my love for birds back into the community as well. So, yeah. Oh, and Natalie asked, can you talk about the wild parrots of SF? That is, I do not have a lot of information about the wild parrots of SF, but I know they are there. Serena? Yeah, um, we're based in the South Bay, so unfortunately we don't do too much in the city, but I am aware that there are feral uh, parrot colonies. Um, a lot of times these, you know, we, we don't really have native parrots, at least not anymore. The Carolina parakeet is long extinct, but um, yeah, other parrots have established colonies and they're often because people have either intentionally set them free or they've escaped. So um, yeah, and some species have been able to thrive. I don't know too much specifically about them or where to find them. There, I believe there is um, a place called Telegraph Hill that has been known for parrots. So that might be a place to check. You can also see if um, again, your local Audubon chapter, I think, uh, might have some information too, since they would uh, let's see if I can, um, whether that's uh, Marin or um, Golden Gate. I got a notification that my internet will hear me. <laughs> That's okay, Serena. I know. We live in the Silicon <laughs> Valley, but for some reason. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Looks like Lakeisha, thank you for that information. Mount Zutro. Might have to check that out.
Mm -hmm. We do have less than 10 minutes left. So if there's anything you guys want to ask or want to know, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're here and happy. This is, this is Bartholomew. <laughs> you can find these guys at the Dollar Tree. And they're really cool. Not anatomically correct, but also just really cool. Let's see. Rose, is there a specific facility you're asking about? And then I guess I can also do a quick recap. Oh, SFBBO. So um, we just have like a little office, but uh, yeah, that's currently closed. Um, a lot of us are working from home um, and some of us are still doing some field work too. Um, so we don't really have like a, a, a headquarters type of thing that people usually visit, but we are still, you know, operating just remotely. Um, and then for uh, Natalie's question, a quick recap of what we talked about, sure. So um, I can actually, since we have a few minutes, we can really just scroll. And we talked a little bit about us and our programs, and why they're important. We introduced you to the scavenger hunt, which you can find on the Bay Area Science Festival page or on our page as well, our registration page. We provided some tips for looking for birds um, and for trying to learn to identify them. And we, that included some more tips here about identification, things to do when you're looking or when you're going out to look for birds and um, just some tips for that. Uh, for looking for birds, so things like Merlin, the All About Birds website by Cornell. I think Serena may have, uh, her, her internet may have gone off again. Um, but Rose, uh, she did say that, um, that we're not doing any um, walks right now um, due to COVID, but there are some talks and uh, virtual activities on our website. Hi everyone, I'm back. <laughs> Hi, Serena. Any other questions? You're welcome, Rose. Yeah, I'm not sure where I got cut off, but Hopefully that was enough of a brief recap. Yes, and the recording should be available on the Bay Area Science Festival page or our Bay Area Science Festival page in a few days. So if you uh, did happen to miss a couple of moments, um, feel free to check it out once it's posted. All right, well, I guess we can pretty much wrap up. We wanna thank you all for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you, uh, you know, having you here and we hope you do participate in the scavenger hunt. Please do uh, send us your observations, um, join us for a closing event. And I think I forgot to mention this earlier, but if you do share your observations with us and you're registered with us, you can enter for a chance to win a little sticker, so which we'll mail out to you. <laughs>